Welcome everybody here to ESWC coverage. SGC versus Ehome is our second game of the day. We just finished with our first round of the day, and that was Monkey Business versus Virus Gaming. They, uh, well, if you want to check that one out, the uh, results will already be up, but Monkey Business being pretty convincing, convincing in their push kind of, or well, half push strat is what they ended up coming up with. I will be your host for the next three days, and as, as I was saying at the very, very start of this broadcast, we'll be joined by professionals along our way, two of my great co-commentators. I am joined by one of them right now. It is Sindarin Man. Welcome to the broadcast. Thank you very much. Uh, I'm looking very much forward to this tournament, of course. We've got uh, a lot of Dota 2 action, which I'm very pleased about. Um, and uh, yeah, some, some very good teams along the way as well. And uh, if you could just give a heads up for me <laughs> and uh, for all the others who haven't been tuning in until just now, what exactly has been going on until now? Uh, until this point, we've only had one game. Uh, we're trying to connect into the servers. We had a couple of lag issues for our first stream, and uh, well, basically, they've all been hopefully solved for this one. Um, thank you very much to the guys from StarCraft 2. Um, interrupting our world of Dota. Uh, but yeah, we have had very, very few matches. Uh, they have actually arrived uh, a little bit late. We started off very, very late here for these games. Um, but we're actually 10 minutes ahead of schedule right now. So it looks like they're actually pumping through the games a little bit faster, not just uh, sticking with the schedule. Uh, but we do actually end up, end up at, with ourselves now in SGC versus eHome. It is eHome's first game of the day as well. They had actually had a, a buy for their first round. All right, yeah, that's going to be uh, that's going to be absolutely fantastic. Of course, uh, I guess it's fair to say that SGC will be the underdogs in that one. Yes, uh, Ehome, the defending champions of ESWC from last year, uh, second place at the international as well. So, uh, yeah, these guys definitely know how to play their Dota 2, and uh, SGC will have to bring their A game to have any sort of chance in this one. Yeah, e Ehome, they're a fantastic team. We have seen them. Uh well, they've been struggling off a little bit in the world of Dota 1, but then they've had some amazing times as well when they just dominate everything. We obviously have to take into account that they were the uh, second place uh, team for the International, uh, taken out by the one and only Na'Vi, which you'll actually get to see tomorrow. And yeah, they might have an amazing, amazing time here. But the funny thing is actually too, because I was talking about, I was talking to Slash about this before um, the tournament actually started off. It was actually a couple of days ago. And EU have really been practicing up on Dota 2, which is obvious considering they're flying to a LAN event to actually compete, but they've actually been using very, very gank-oriented heroes, very, very similar to the uh, kind of style they're actually using at the International. And we see that right now too. They, uh, pick, up, they pick up Night Stalker as their first one. So, so far, Night Stalker, Venomancer, Mirana uh, coming up for the Radiant. We see Tidehunter as well as Windrunner, and Witch Doctor for the first time as well for ESWC, appearing now from SGC. Yeah, this is a very, very... Uh very, very unusual draft coming out here from, uh, well, especially from SGC, uh, picking up these three heroes the first uh, in the first round. We don't usually see uh, both Tide and Witch Doctor going through in the first phase. Windrunner is not a, so uncommon a pick in the first round, uh, especially not in Dota 2, in which Windrunner is, um, there's, few, there's less heroes in Dota 2 who are good for offlaning uh, right now. In, and the two of the good ones are Potom and Windrunner, so either side has got one now. Um, but as, as far as Witch Doctor and Tide goes, that's, that's unusual to see them pick this early, but th this might be a pocket strategy from SGC. Uh, what I usually call a pocket strategy, or what is referred to as a pocket strategy, is that you want five specific heroes. And um, maybe SGC have got something planned with this, because it, it doesn't seem like something you just... It doesn't seem like what you just pick standard, right? While on the Radiant side, these heroes, on the other hand, are are way more common to see in, in this early phase of the draft. Night Stalker was one of the big guns during the International, was uh, either banned or picked in the first phase every single time. Venomancer uh, had a very high rating as well, and of course Potom, uh, we saw the winning team Na'Vi picking that every single game to play it on the offlane. I think they had it every single game, if I'm not wrong, or maybe all games apart from one or two. Um, so so that, is, that is definitely one of their, one of their favorite heroes there, and they, and they showed how you could really play that offlane in Dota 2. Uh, so, question is if that's Ehome's plan or not, but um, yeah, we'll, we'll see how the draft goes, but this, this looks very, very interesting from, uh, from both sides. Mm -hmm. um, but, but I just want to give a, uh, a big comment out right now to what the people are currently tuning in. Um, thank you to the guys on the IRC who are trying to actually help out a little bit, let me know about the volume levels to see if they're actually going to be balanced. I am trying to actually keep it as balanced as possible. I do also realize that it's actually going through the roof a couple of times. So yes, 
Um, hopefully everything does stay as balanced as possible for you. I'm hearing volume is fine now, so I'm happy with that. There's only a very, very small delay on the stream too. Should also point that out to um, uh, for all the guys out there, if you are listening, uh, if you want to have a Russian stream, Volat and Kasper are both, both are restreaming this stream. Uh, I apologize to them for the first game. We were not expecting that lag to actually happen, but that's why we actually fix it for the second game. Uh, also, there's Anderson casting out in, the, in Chinese, and uh, Sindarin is actually casting as my co-commentator off the stream as well because of the land box at uh, ESWC and because none of us are actually at that location. We're all casting from remote. Only one person can actually remotely connect in or else the land box goes nuts. Uh, the fun world of beta. The fun world of beta. <laughs> I, lo I love how two SGC actually ban out Tinker. Uh, we're actually told uh, just before we actually started off this tournament, Sin, that there was actually a glitch with Tinker where you could re um, Necromicon. Oh dear. Yeah. <laughs> so, That's um, what we were talking about, man. Do you remember that cast? Mm -hmm. Yeah. yeah. It, we we, 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 we were talking about what would happen if you could just create a whole bunch of blue Necromicons, just run them at people, and they would just die and just destroy your entire team. Um, yeah. But So uh, there is a glitch with Tinker. Um, that we are now aware of, and uh, yeah, I don't know what the admins actually decided on it, uh, but we are seeing Tinker being banned out by the Dyer. Yeah, and I, I, I have to be honest with you, I don't think it's because of the glitch. I think it's because uh, on the on the Radiant side we have a Weapon X, and uh, that Tinker, he's very, very renowned for that hero. He plays it brilliantly, can totally dominate you across the map. We saw him playing it uh, during the International, I think, once or twice. Uh, and, and he is just one of those one of those players you really don't want to give Tinker to unless you really have to do it. So I, I guess SGC were like, all right, we've got a we've got a ban left over, so uh, we could ban that Tinker, and that's what they did. Um, another thing I need to, uh, I just want to point out: it's great that people in the chat are asking this. Of course, we need to uh, remember that this is Dota 2. Uh, we have a lot of viewers probably tuning in that haven't really played Dota before. Uh, so when I call Mirana Potom. Uh, people are like, what is Potom? So that was a great question from, from the chat right there. Make sure to ask us if there's anything that's unclear to you because you're new to the game. It's all about getting everybody into this world of Dota 2. Uh, the reason we call Mirana, which is the third pick of the Radiant, the reason we call her Potom is that her original uh, hero type from, uh, from the original Dota in Warcraft 3 was Priestess of the Moon, which is basically what P-O-T-M stands for. Mm -hmm. uh, we'll try to get used to calling her Mirana. Of course, those old habits are going to stick. Uh, sometimes we might call the Radiant the Sentinel, sometimes we might call the Dyer the, the Scourge. Uh, but we try to, uh, to adapt and, uh, and get used to the new language, that, uh, or the new jargon, you could say, that uh, Dota 2 uses. But we're, we're, we're getting there. Yeah, anyway. th th there's always those fun things. It's just like we used to Sentinel and Scourge, now it's Radiant and Dyer. For people who are like, it's Legion and Hellborn. Or, uh, I, I, what's the League of Legends equivalent? Um, I don't know, Blue and Purple? <laughs> I, nice, I man. You, you played a crap load more League of Legends than I ever did. Anyway, we, we get ourselves into the game right now, so I'm just going to check and make sure the uh, stream is actually running pretty smoothly. There's a little bit of frame loss, but uh, hopefully it will be uh, fine for the majority of it. Yeah, you, you can also tell me too if the stream's actually having issues, considering that's actually what you're watching. So let's actually run through our team right now. So E-Home, we have X on the top lane. He'll be playing as Marana. He has been joined by uh, us. He'll be playing as Venomancer. Nuz will be Dro Ranger. QQQ uh, playing as Night Stalker. And that leaves one more hero who is trailing behind the Earthshaker, PCT. Uh, I love these names. I can't believe it's been so long since I've actually been to I mean, able to actually cast E-Home. Uh, but they're all looking for a kill already up here on that top. Yeah, you gotta love these nicknames, man. It's it's not too hard, man. It's it's three letters. You'll always get it right. P C E T. You know, it's, it makes you wonder what actually all the nicknames stand for. I'm not completely sure, but they obviously when you have such a long tag as uh, as E H Gigabyte, then uh, you don't have many lef letters left over in Dota One. Uh, but actually, here in Dota Two, if these guys wanted to, they could write out their full nicknames because it runs over the Steam engine. And uh, that means that obviously the way you nickname yourself in-game corresponds to the way you nickname yourself in Counter-Strike. So you don't have the same limitations as, as, uh, as how it goes to nicknames. Uh, you can pretty much, I'm not sure what the, what the limit of characters is, but it's very, very much larger than these guys are running. But I guess they're sticking to the nicknames from Dota 1 because that's what people know them, know them as. Mm -hmm. uh, while SGC, well, they've got a short tag, so obviously I've got some longer nicknames. We've got Golic playing the Witch Doctor down on bottom together with Warlog's Tidehunter. Uh, I think the Windrunner. I can't remember who exactly was oh, playing Tullix. her, but I guess you'll run through them. Yeah, Tolix playing that Windrunner, and then we've got a Weaver as well as that Slada on the two other lanes, and uh, I guess you'll have to introduce who they are. Yeah, we've got Kranich going up. So as you can see, the Battle of the Melees in the middle lane, so it'll be Slada going up against Nightstalker in the mid, 
and uh, Cranich playing as that Slada and QQQ as the Night Stalker. Uh, Sun One uh, will be our Weaver, solo Weaver on that top lane. And he'll be having himself a fun time going up against X as well as PCT. I think uh, PCT, well, our low first blood. Uh, I saw the first one, I saw the first blood of the first game, but this time Tolix actually managed to pick up the Dro Ranger on the bottom lane. The DD room there by Wish Doctor, it looks like he's popped off his cask. We've got ourselves a shackle shot, and we've got ourselves a gush. And between the two of them, uh, three of them, they managed to actually bring down the Dro Ranger on that bottom lane. So, uh, drinking time, Sin, drinking. Yeah, well, that, that DD rune from the Witch Doctor was uh, obviously very useful. DD meaning uh, double damage. Uh, one of the runes you can find in the river, they spawn every two minutes, and uh, it's random which ability it actually has. There can be a double damage, regeneration, illusion, uh, invisibility, and uh, finally, one more that I've got, haste. Uh, so there, there are some different utility you can find in the river every two minutes the rune spawns. Um, and if it hasn't been picked up beforehand, a new one does not spawn. So it's all about picking them up as often as you can. And um, th these runes have a big impact on the game, as you just saw there. Golic Witch Doctor has a high amount of base damage on that hero, and the fact that he gets a double damage rune just means he hurts like a truck on that lane. And uh, yeah, that was obviously too much for Draw Ranger to handle. Yeah, considering you got three stuns that can hold him there, and then you got that truck hitting him continuously, continuous times as well, it does make life difficult for the Draw Ranger. But Dre Ranger is also one of those heroes that doesn't require a crap load of farm to actually become a, a big player inside this game. She can harass nicely. We're even seeing it right now as Wall is going up there to pick up the, uh, the uh, second rune of the game, which once again goes to SGC. So that rune control really coming out very, very nicely for SGC, picking up that Invis rune on Tidehunter, which is going to make life a living hell for Dre Ranger and Venomanta to get anywhere near this creep wave to get any form of XP or last hits or any form of farm. Yeah, the moment that Tidehunter is invisible, they're, they're going to be uncertain uh, in which position they're actually on on the lane. And I, I, I believe Draw Ranger realized that Tide picked up that Invis rune. I think she saw it when she was harassing him from above. Uh, so now they're going to be very defensive on the lane, knowing that if they go any further, Tidehunter is going to open on them with that gush for the slow and miner's armor, and he's going to stand right behind them, starting to, um, to hit them right away. And, uh, well, that's not something they wanted want to get the hit by, that's for sure. Yeah, they've already started right now. Windrunner can't get in a good position for a good shackle. So uh, just dropping the life of Dre Ranger down to half. Warlock realizes Invis was about to wear off because uh, the runes don't last forever. They do actually have a timed life. So uh, unable to actually stick there forever and wait for the right time to actually initiate. But on the bright side, there's another rune spawning up in a couple of seconds. We do see a bottle up on Night Stalker as well. So I think our, our time of, not, of uh, Tide Hunter or the bottom lane taking the runes will be over soon. Crash actually in a lot of trouble here in the middle lane. He doesn't actually have enough mana for a, for a crush. And uh, pfft, once again, blood on the bottom lane. Shackle shot now goes and uh, looks like I actually have initiated him behind. And Dro Ranger dies for the second time during this game. And Venomancer is just left to pick up the pieces. Yeah, that trial lane working out brilliantly for um, for SGC at this point, and they've got to make it they've got to make it count as well because obviously when you're playing a three against two lane, you've really got to get something from it. And um, well, so far so good getting two kills down there. Uh, the question is how much they're actually paying up top playing that Shaker uh, uh, Shaker Mirana against that Weaver up there. Uh, Weaver might get very little farm, so they have to um, they have to get something in a trade down here on bottom. And yeah, two kills and a very very low farm draw. Ranger is definitely the trade they're looking for. Yeah, they might be looking for a couple more kills right now too. We see Cranish actually picking up an Invis rune, so either he'll head back in towards mid lane, which actually looks like where he's actually headed. He's uh, got that bottle too, so he'll store that for safekeeping. I thought they might actually look to initiate once again on that bottom lane, but they've got to be careful about Night Stalker. There's one thing we haven't actually mentioned just yet. Night Stalker almost up to level 6, but uh, the more important thing is we're about to actually head in towards night time. And that's going to be a, a big, big testing time for SGC if they can actually deal with QQQ as that Night Stalker. Yeah, Night Stalker is just one of those heroes. The, reasons, the reason he's such a popular pick is, um, well, the moment it gets night, <laughs> as, uh, as his name kind of expresses, he is... Uh, He's very, very powerful during the night. He's the only hero in the game who has a significant difference whether it's day or night. During the night, his third skill, Hunter in the Night, gets available, and it gives him passive movement and attack speed, and it gives him a lot of it, as well as making his uh, first skill, the Void, uh, slows for a longer duration, and his second skill, uh, Crippling Fear, silences for a longer duration as well. So he, he gets devastating during the night time, and uh, well, as you guys can see, up on top, the clock is running. Uh, Right now it's yellow, 
And uh, the moment it turns blue, the night time actually starts. So right now, it's pretty much uh, we're one hour away from night time. As you can see, the, the moment it's filled with yellow, it turns over to night. And then it, we're going to have a long period of night time. And that's when QQQ is going to come out, try to roam through these lanes and get a lot of kills with his increased movement and attack speed, as well as the slow and silence. It's, it's one of the best gankers of the game, and we'll definitely see Ehome taking advantage of that. And we just hit night time. We just hit night time. And that's when we see him moving a lot faster. The wings open up, the mouth opens up in the portrait picture. And Slada knows that he really cannot fight this, uh, this Night Stalker at this point. But Night Stalker also realizes he can actually hunt around. And there's the Invis room in the bottom lane, which is picked up by the Witch Doctor. Night Stalker would be a little bit annoyed about that fact. He would have really, really loved that. That would have actually sealed the first uh, kill there for Ehome, who is actually still not on the board just yet. SGC's tri lane is actually working a lot better for them. Uh, then just a dual lane of Dro Ranger as well as Venomancer. In the meantime, too, we got our X and PCT, the Mirana and ES combo on the top lane, something which we actually haven't talked about. Hello, what is our Night Stalker actually doing? Run all the way back to base and actually picking up a stick charge. Uh, picking up a full stick. Obviously, he can't pick Did up Did he pick charge. up a TP scroll as well? Because he should definitely get out on those lanes with the town portal to, didn't to have get something Didn't have done. money for it. Didn't have money for a, for a scroll. See, but yeah, it's 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 really important. I mean, the first night is perhaps the time of the game that Night Stalker does the most for the team. The first and second nights, at least. Mm -hmm. During that, he has to get some kills. He gets a lot of farm up from those kills because obviously it will succeed if he actually gets the initiation out. It's it's a very very secure kill when you have a Balinar, or well, Night Stalker as he's called in in Dota 2. Uh, so far, might have some secondary names coming up later on. Uh, but once that Night Stalker gets in and gets that gang, needs that gold, and, um, yeah, well, several item builds are available to this hero. The most, uh, the most feared one, probably, or at least usually is, uh, as we might have some action coming up. I'm, you just have to interrupt me if that goes on. Of course, we should just uh, mention that quickly. I am casting off the stream right now because we only have one slot in the game, and uh, that means that I will be delayed from Toby, so we might overlap a little bit with some action. That's the... Um, I believe all the four op slots are taken in the game, am I right? Uh, actually, you can only connect into one of the op slots, so we're actually the only person in observer, in observer slots uh -huh, because okay. of the limitations of the land box. I see. All right. Um, but yeah, that, that Balinar, what you usually want to get on that hero, or will often want to get on that hero, is, of course, the Agony Eight minute rune taken up. Gush will go on. Venomancer needs to get out of here. Nice Dogger's going to come in. Venomancer gets up high enough. Night Stalker comes in, he gets stunned up by the Witch Doctor, and Witch Doctor now forfeits his life. Venomancer even pops off a sound to come back into actually join a power shot off from Windrunner. But this is the power we talk about from Night Stalker. He is just ripping through everything. Now PCT wants to come into where she get a bit of a hand. He's already thrown down the fissure. Night Stalker, he's gonna get a triple kill here right now if he can catch up to Tullix, which he definitely can. Earthshaker in the end says, you know what, screw that man. I'm gonna fissure that off. Take the kill off you so I can get some form of farm. Nice talk is actually caught between the fissure. Now I can walk past the uh, the fissure and down back down the stairs again. But 2-0 has been to SGC the entire time. First night time, three kills. Very, very fast in the hands of E-Home. Yeah, that Balan are really leading the battle there. What, what's so powerful about this hero as well, he's got a high hit point pool as well as a big amount of armor. Uh, when you look at him right now, 1100 HP and 9 armor on that hero. So he's very hard to bring down with his high mobility. Uh, during the daytime, not really that fearful, uh, or that fearsome, I guess it's called. Uh, but once we get during the night here, he's just uh, absolutely terrifying. And uh, we'll see what item build QQQ goes for. What I was about to, uh, to say before that action actually happened was that the Aghanim Scepter on Balinar uh, gives him, um, on the Night Stalker, sorry, yeah, old habits, you know. Um, <laughs> once, uh, once the Night Stalker gets that uh, Aghanim Scepter up, uh, it improves his ultimate so that whenever it's night time, um, he basically has, I think it's 2,000 area of effect of unobstructed vision. So he can see across cliffs, uh, he can see through trees, he can see everything in a large radius during the night. So he's kind of a super ward uh, that you have moving around, and that just makes him even even more terrifying to play against as a ganker. Yeah, well, we, 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 like, we love to refer to it as, the, as a legal map hack, because uh, you can basically just see anything you want to around yourself. It is actually one of the most powerful abilities you can actually have when you want to go ganking off. Looks like uh, Venomancer and uh, ES are saying, saying hi to Tight Hunter once again. It's, it's, a, it's the uh, massive battle for the runes in this. The Diddy rune's actually on the top lane, and Cranch actually sprints himself up there to stop Mariah from actually bottling it up. So uh, we do see a double damage rune into the hands of Slada. 
He might look if uh, that Venomancer gets caught out a little bit out of position. Might be able to get that kill. Night Stalk in the meantime, though. Got to keep a very, very close eye on him. Urn of, Charges, um, Urn of Shadows is already up, which is not surprising at this point. Weaver just shooking himself around. Really hard to actually kill him until they get the silence. There goes the silence. Starfall's got a couple it right now. Actually, no! They were unable to put the silence off, but it's uh, spent all of his mana right now. So QQQ can easily die of, it, die of this. Uh, but doesn't in the end, just buys a lot of space for X and actually forces the Weaver to run all the way back to the main base. Warlog down the bottom lane, tanking up two hits from the tower. I think they really want to go for the Dro Ranger. He goes inside the trees to find the Dro Ranger. Warlog's going to be really careful. The Cold Arrow is slowing him down. There's a good fissure. There is a small gap, however. He can actually get around the trees. But Nice Stalker is TP'd in. The Silence, the slow. He needs one more here on Tullix. The Silence wore off, so Tullix is able to actually use that Windrun ability. There goes that Void. Tight Hunter. Magister to actually escape. Sliders now here on that bottom lane. No, he doesn't actually. Titan's actually caught out. Nice stalker with a double kill. Kranich trying to move back. Slowed once again. I thought Titan was actually amazing. He went to the side shop, pulled up a TP scroll, but no, he decided to actually stick around and die. So Windrunner and Titan are taking a fall. And Nice stalker once again with a double kill. Uh, he's getting big on QQQ, and uh, these gangs are just working out free home. These fights. Uh, they happen exactly like they want them, and the problem for the guys down on that bottom lane for SGC right now is that Tidehunter hasn't reached the level 6. They're going to need that Ravage as either a defensive mechanism to escape from this, or as an aggressive mechanism to actually try to take the kills. Uh, but the problem down on bottom is they just don't have the damage to cope with this power of Ehom right now, that Balinar. Night Stalker, uh -huh. uh, they, they, can't really, they can't really bring him down. Uh, they've, they've got a Gush, that, which is fine enough reducing the armor. They've got a Bouncing Stun from Witch Doctor. A little Whoop. bit of... Bottom line, we're going to go again. Already going on the Witch Doctor. Night Stalker pops off the Invis and realizing he's over, in over his head. And, uh, well, maybe not. Crank's actually going down a little bit further towards the Dro Ranger. Tide Hunter's here in support. He's actually not... He's not even level 5 yet. Kranich actually hit right next to the Dro Ranger. The Gush will actually come through as well. Dro Ranger should take a fall right now. And we actually enter the daytime. We enter the daytime at the same time this actually starts off. But Nice Stalker does have that ultimate up his sleeve. With allows him to actually change the daytime into the nighttime. And uh, we'll see him actually hang down there on that bottom lane after popping off that Invis rune. That's just blocking Kranich for now. But there's nothing you can really do to stop this tier 1 tower from going down. There's no support. Uh, fortification will slow them down for the moment. QQQ now actually popping up the ultimate, wants to go on the Tide Hunter. Silence as well as damage, but uh, still he can't get close enough towards the Witch Doctor, just pops off the Restoration, keeps the Tide alive. There's just no opening right now for Night, for Night Stalker. Yeah, it's really important for SGC to take this tower now. That's the advantage of that trial lane down there in that bottom lane. Uh, finally break through. Oh, Witch Doctor, don't tower. do it, I think you just did. He hung around a little bit too long, and the daytime! It comes back again. There's a negative urn charge right now on the Witch Doctor. The Slider will come through and threaten the Crush. In fact, actually, he doesn't just threaten, and he goes on an amplified damage on the Nice Stalker too. And uh, all he can do is just pop a Void off there on Cranch, but Cranch with such high movement speed when he actually puts off that sprint. But they don't get the kill on the end. Nice Stalker just runs back to where his Tier 1 tower used to be. Yeah, 5-3 to three the score for your home right now. Um... Balinar definitely, Night Stalker, damn it, uh, definitely the um, the one who's carried out the most of the action for Ehom during that time. So I wonder how much Potom has actually farmed, and if you can look at the gold difference as well, which is, uh, yeah, the gold difference graph uh, inside the game of who has the lead. Obviously, there's one tower advantage for SGC, so that should give them a lot of gold. Uh, but the question is, do they actually even have the lead with that? Because I think the, the Marana has farmed a lot. They have a lead about f by about 1,500 gold. You'll be able to see it up on your screen now. There's only about a three-second delay on the stream, so it shouldn't take too long before it comes up. Yeah, looking over those uh, creep stats, actually, uh, Weapon X is sitting on 60, and the, the Weaver is sitting on 45 up on that top lane. So uh, Weaver hasn't really been locked down much by this bottom, uh, sorry, by this uh, Mirana Earthshaker lane. Uh, so that, that is, um, that's looking very good PCT. for SGT. Fissure! Yes, actually letting off the old one for this, but he's already gushed, he's already, uh, he's already crushed. And uh, Slata gets the last hit there on the Earthshaker. It was just wanting to go plan a ward, man. And that was all. An instant pressure from SGC on that bottom lane. Could you actually do a little bit of damage to the Tier 2 tower right now with that Earthshaker gone? Nice talk is back, but that ultimate's on cooldown. He's still during daytime. So he's actually not as much of a threat as he normally is. But with Venno there as well, that will help out. But uh, Talix is actually pushing out the mid lane. What right, top! Come up there just at the right time to watch Weaver get arrowed, starfall, and killed. 
And X Man just actually claimed Weaver's life. So there's your shutdown you're asking for. Two Shackle. Doesn't actually latch on here in the middle lane on Night Stalker. Bounce done will go and wish it to pops off the ultimate. They kill off the Night Stalker during the daytime. Oh, will they? He's not dead yet. The Ravage from Warlog. He wanted to save it. It was forced to actually pop off in the end. And they will claim uh, not only the Night Stalker's life, but they will claim the Tier 1 tower in the middle lane. And these are the kind of kills that really make a big difference. These kills are so important. Getting, uh, getting that kill which leads them to taking the tower. That's what this game is all about. It's about taking the map in your hands and taking control of it. And now SGC have taken down two towers. They might be behind by one kill, but these towers give a lot of gold. They give 200 gold to each player. The outer towers do that. Uh, then the towers inside give plus 40 gold for each tower it is. So the tier two towers give 240, tier three give 280, and tier four give 320 to each single hero on the team, as well as a bonus. Uh, for actually either last hitting it or having your team um, last hit it, then you split the gold if um, if the Dyer or the Radiant respectively get the kill. SGC. That's out. There goes our Gush. Silence as well as you're trying to stop Windrunner as well as uh, Wish Doctor from casting off Anthony they've got, but it's still not enough. And Slada comes through as well. Crushes on the Venomancer, but the Marana ulti for the moment will actually keep Venomancer alive. Venomancer hanging inside the tree area, but he doesn't realize Crunch is still there. He'll pop off the Amplified Damage, which gives him the vision. Also helps him just basically kill him off. And uh, once again, actually going inside the trees, Venomancer puts up a Venom award there to actually stop the path there from Slider to chase him in. But there is a secondary path, and Venomancer goes down the bottom lane. Two kills here to SGC and E-Home really actually having some issues right now. And we're probably still another two, three minutes away before we hit nighttime again, Sind. Yeah, and uh, what we haven't really talked about much yet is, is who actually benefits from, uh, from this game going late. Uh, because obviously there is the potential that this does become a long game, even though we have uh, gang powerful heroes such as uh, the Night Stalker and uh, Shackle, and Fissure, trying to hold Night Stalker in place. Will he die again? Urshaker pops off the ultimate. Wish Doctor pops off his instead. Gets the kill there on the Night Stalker. A good arrow on the Witch Doctor. So going to be a long, long stun. Starfall, one hit, two hit. Needs a third one to actually get the kill. Not with the restoration. It's going to make it four and now even more. Shackle shot hits perfectly there, holding X next to PCT. So Mirana takes the fall as well. Nine to six. Crunch is not done just yet. He wants to kill up the Drone Ranger with a crush. He gets it. Will cost his own life though. Venomancer gets the kill. Warlock still here. Tullix holds the Earthshaker in place. Shackles him to a tree and then gets the kill. Witch Doctor once again getting the last hit. It's almost like Moose Star Witch Doctor. Uh, in the end, Venomancer is the only one to actually live. Looks like he's actually going to see if he can actually track down Warlock here. Can almost do it too. If he gets himself a good um, hit there with the ward, he actually got to focus the ward there on the Tide Hunter. Un unable to actually do so. So Venomancer unable to get a, a, at least a small revenge kill. And Slaughter is the only one to actually die for the Dire. Yeah, really big individual plays coming out of Tullix. They're landing three consecutive shackle shots. Uh, makes a big, big difference in these fights. Obviously, the first one, the most important, the one that linked two heroes together. Or actually, that was the second one. The first one linked Balinar to uh, the Night Stalker to a creep. The second one linking uh, Mirana to Earthshaker, meaning that both of them get stunned during the full duration of that. And, uh, yeah, well, that just sets up the fight magnificently for SGC. They trade the Slada for four kills, as well as I think they took quite a bit of damage on that tower. I'm not sure if they did. Uh, I guess you'll have to take a look is at that one. Is it three quarters? Three quarters, all right. So they took they took a munch on that uh, on that tier two tower, and uh, and as I said, what this game is all about is getting that map control, slowly reducing the area the the opponent actually have, has left, and uh, it's working out brilliantly for SGC right now. I'm very very uh, impressed by the the current um, the way they're putting the fights currently. Great coordination, great synergy with their heroes, and they're definitely playing their A game right now. Now, SGC actually having a, a great time. A lot of people when they when they saw the uh, first group actually being announced. Oh, and low too. This looks like it's Roshan time. <laughs> he throws a cask on the, on the uh, Roshan, and Roshan didn't even like bat an eyelid. Uh, but with the uh, with the damage, they, as well as restoration they've actually got here, they should be able to bring down Roshan pretty easily with only three heroes doing it. Like, we've still got Tullex back on the lane. We've got Weaver, who hasn't left that top lane the entire game. And Roshan's actually almost dead. So SGC, there is a ward that was watching for this, and um, the smoke actually allowed SGC to enter the Roshan pit, and now uh, Wish Doctor would have just shown himself just set around the Roshan pit, but it's already too late. Roshan's gone. Cranish gets himself an Aegis Seymour, drops a TP scroll for it, and uh, E Home. Well, things just are not going right for them in this first game. 
Definitely going right for SGC though, and that's the perfect time to take that Roshan. Having the having the dire position on the map, and as you said, using that smoke of deceit, they get in and take down that Roshan. They've got tons of minus armor. Gush, as well as amplified damage from Slada, enables them to take down Roshan very, very quickly, even with only three heroes. And uh, yeah, that that just leads us to the next question. When the, if this one goes later on, who has the bigger chance? I mean, Ehome have obviously got two long-range agility heroes uh, in Mirana as well as Draw Ranger. On the other hand, on the Dire side, we've got lots of Miner's Armor coupled up with a Weaver as well as a Windrunner. If Windrunner gets some items up that deal damage, for instance, uh, a Scythe of Vise and maybe an MKB, she's going to be able to utilize that Miner's Armor very, very well. And um, on both sides, good teamfight heroes as well. We've got Tie Hunter for the Ravage. Uh, we've got Earthshaker for the Echo Slam. And it's, it's very hard to predict, actually, what's going to go on here. So if this one goes late, I don't know who to put my money on. Yeah, it's going to be interesting. As I was just watching uh, Nine Stalker kill off the Witch Doctor. Um, we are now into our second stage of night time, so it is his time to actually shine. I was a little bit worried the courier was going to get caught out. We saw a quarter staff being flown down towards the bottom lane, and uh, that is going to be for the Windrunner. It's actually completed a four staff already now. The 21 minutes in, we've got Mech, four staff, and Arcane Boots with the Ring of Basilius. It's a lot of fun for the Windrunner. The Windrunner, uh, Tullix. Uh, we've seen him get a couple of kills, 3-2 to two already, and uh, it's the first one to actually pop 100 CS. Pops it before the Marana actually does, with Marana at a hunt, um, wanting to get to 100. But Marana is also, looks like she's going actually for the Awkward, the Malevolence, at this point. So possibly yeah, they want shut to shut down the that, Weaver. Yeah, I was about to say, they want to have an additional silence, because what they can utilize this for is, they've got the, uh, they've got the Night Stalker silence, which is single target, which is great. They can throw that... For instance, on the Weaver or on the Tide Hunter, uh, either to Ooh, prevent nice the Weaver trouble. Crane's already starting up. He needs the amplified damage. He gets it too. Nice Stalker needs to get out. The shackle. There's a mini sum there from Tullix. It's a good time for the Fidget. With a power shot, kills off Night Stalker. Tullix, once again, the right place. P PCT tried to actually help out, but it wasn't enough in the end. And we see too many heroes now rallying up towards the top lane. PCT realize they can't hold on towards this tier 1 tower any longer, so they will try and deny it, and they actually do so eventually too. PCT with a denial on the tower, and Night Stalker going down during night time. Yeah, another important kill for SJC. And uh, yeah, just to finish off my trail of thought from before, having those silences on the Radiant side is crucial. Being able to silence the Tide Hunter, obviously, his Kraken Shell ability is passive, uh, makes him remove all debuffs on himself whenever he takes 600 damage. But what, what the Radiant will have with an Orchid Malevolence, as well as that Balinar uh, Night Stalker Silence, is that they have silences that deal no damage. So they can choose just to silence him off and ignore him. That means they won't get the Ravage on them, and they still have silences uh, left for, for the Weaver, who's going to be devastating later on. They've got uh, Draw Ranger Silence, uh, they've got Night Stalker Silence, obviously, as well as the Orchid, and that means they can play around in different ways in the fight. So uh, I totally agree with this item choice coming out of X. Yeah, let's see if uh, they can actually get some uh, kills off right now. Tight under hasn't popped off the Ravish just yet. He had 20 HP until the mech charge pops off. Exit did not want to stick around and pop off anymore. And Venom has actually TB'd in, popped off his ultimate. Warlock will actually die right now. He gets four staff down. Great positional play here by the Tight under. He does die. Slider gets one on the Earthshaker. And uh, still actually a lot of trouble here for Slider. Nice Stalker during the night time doing a lot of damage. And it will actually pop off the Aegis, the Immortal. That's why he's being so aggressive. Weaver, they might be able to shut him down. The Silence as well is a slow weaver not dead just yet the arrow from x actually missing now weaver is dead double kill for the night stalker crunch goes up to finish off the tower but the drone range of slow arrows will easily hold slardar in place night stalker's trying to wait before he goes in but tullix is back again starfall needs to come starfall does come tullix actually four staffing himself away from x X already with the leap has himself that little bit of extra momentum. Doesn't have an arrow just yet, but will he be able to hit it? Talix is on the run back out. Arrow will now shoot. Will it hit? It flies. Talix sees it going though, but Night Stalker's there. Mech charge pops off again. Needs to get closer. Night slow. Is there a void? Is there a void? Unable to actually get there. Warlock TP's in. And uh, looks like actually Night Stalker jumping in behind. He catches out the Witch Doctor. It's not even the one he wanted to kill. Gush goes in, Marana with a star fall, not enough to kill off the Witch Doctor, he's trying to actually keep himself alive with a negative earn charge on him, it's not helping out, the Courier flies over the top just to basically see things from a perspective, it's like the blip of Dota 2, and uh, looks like Ehome unable to actually pick off any of these retreating heroes, all the new ones coming in, um, X also just a little bit too close to that Weaver will fall back as well. I guess during that chase up there on the Witch Doctor, you just saw how powerful that Night Stalker Silence is, Obviously, you'll be able to see that the unit is silenced because there's some sort of um, 
there's like a, a rag doll, which is uh, which has some zippered through its mouth or something, as some sort of better logo for now at least. Uh, so clear indication of that your hero is silenced, and it l l you just saw how long it lasted. That witch doctor really wanted to use his paralyzing cask, but he never got the chance to do it. Uh, he just had to keep running, did survive, luckily for him, but it was very close. And that Night Stalker silence, it's just so freaking long. Uh, it really shuts you down when it comes to a lot of fights, and if you want to combine that silence with the awkward, the malevolence as well, the, the Weaver or whoever, anybody, Slada would never be able to pop off anything. They can shut down two heroes very, very early on in the fight. Arrow actually flying down towards the bottom lane. Just missing there on the Witch Doctor. Gush will come in from Warlock. The ES actually lands off a Fissure and <laughs> forces X to actually leap out of their PCT. We're just like, oh my god, got a stun, got a stun. Oh, hang on, I did actually just block Marana in on the edge of the ramp then. So she had to leap herself away to safety in the end. But does live. So we'll be happy about that at least. It's amazing how much farm this Dread Range has actually got. We'll check out our CS scores once again. Because I want to see how Dro Ranger's actually been going. Dro's actually 79 for 15. Five deaths for the Dro Ranger is not helping them out at all. Ravage now pops off in the middle lane. The Wish Doctor Ultimate's already killed off the Night Stalker. They held him in place with the stuns. Venomancer actually came in towards the mid now, gets shackled. There's a secondary gush, there's a power shot as well. And then the bounce, uh, bounce stun just kills off the rest of the creep wave. The tier 2 tower will more than likely take a fall right now with the amount of power they've got to push out this mid. Tullock's actually not using the Focus Fire for this, which I actually thought he might have to actually kill it. There we go. Focus Fire is now going. ES Fissure goes as well as the uh, Fortification there from the Radiant. Try and slow it down, but while Tullock just sits there on the edge, he will easily kill off the uh, easily kill off this tier 2 tower and then fall back. Yeah, another tower claimed by SJC, and that means only one of the outer towers remains for... Uh, for Ehom, which is the bottom tier 2, and uh, that's going to be a lot of more gold down the sleeves of SGC. They've only lost two towers themselves. I think they denied at least one of them, meaning that the enemy only gets half the gold. Um, and yeah, looking very, very good for SGC, this. Yeah, SGC are looking amazing, and uh, yeah, we just saw the tier 1 tower in the bottom lane getting denied. So, uh, denials all around. We do see the Orc of the Malevolence now completed on Mirana, though. So she has finally got towards that item. So things might change up when the team fights actually happen, but I think it's a big problem for Ehome right now. They keep getting called out like Night Stalker. He, he obviously feels the need to be aggressive during the night time, which obviously he does need to be as well. But he's overextending himself a couple of times, getting called out. Mirana, like, getting called out, just trying to check for the rune. SGC, they're really controlling a lot of this map, and that's obviously mainly due to a lot of the Tier 1 towers. In fact, every single Tier 1 tower in the map is actually dead, but they still actually have their Tier 2 towers there. They have that, that uh, support outside of their main base, which gives them the confidence to move around, the ward placements as well. They're really just trying to keep tabs on everything Ehome are doing and trying to make the most of these opportunities, where Ehome are like, oh, hang on, I'm not really expecting you to be there, I get ganked, and there's a 4v5 battle when it shouldn't be. It's very, very true, and uh, the map control right now is definitely uh, what is, um, what's giving SGC a good, uh, a good placement in this game, doing very well on the warding. Actually, both sides have got some nice wards out, uh, keeping tabs on, on what's going on in the map. Um, but yeah, the, the question is what Ehome's game plan is right now. Do, do they feel confident going into late game? They're going to be because confident going to a team fight. Marana sets up with the ultimate arrow, will fly out. It doesn't hit anybody. It goes straight through the Gale and Venno ulti setting up here. The dust already pops up as well. Ravage goes. Night Stalker trying to kill off Kranich with a BKB. He is losing his life fast and he's actually killing off Kranich. We do see Wind Windrun take a fall as well as Venomancer, but Night Stalker is about to go as well. So much death everywhere. Slido with a double kill. He's about to make it a triple. Kill. He can't make it a quad because Dro Range is dying in the back end. The entire of Ehome just got royally wiped around that tier 2 tower. They tried to set up there with the Marana ultimate. The arrow never hits. They couldn't take out Tidehunter before he could pop up his ultimate. And Cranich with that BKB unstoppable on the front lines. Yeah, what a fight for SGC there. But on the other hand, what a mistake from Ehome. I'm not sure they expected that one to come through. Uh, the only way they could have pulled off that fight was definitely to lock down that Tidehunter in a silence chain and then just try to kill everybody else. But Warlock getting off a brilliant Ravage. SGC are going to take that fight 5 for 1 and they're going to go even to try to get the barracks now. Um, 
What I was about to say beforehand is what is Ehome's game plan? They've got some good turtling heroes if they want to defend for a long time. They've got Earthshaker as well as Venomancer with the Plague Wards, with the Fissure. And I think that was just a bad play call coming out of Ehome. That was not what they should have gone for. And, uh, well, that's going to cost them the barracks this time around. And that, that's definitely the worst fight they could have imagined at this point. Uh, Ehome, like... This, this, is, this is what I was worried about. Ehome, obviously, they spent most of their time playing Dota 1. And they come into Dota 2, and it does feel different. It's a different way of actually playing it. And SGC, all they do every single day, day in, day out, I always see at least one, two of them online playing matchmaking for Dota 2. They're always training. They're always playing as a team. They do still also play Dota 1 matches, but they're a very, very, very focused squad right now. And they've really come to this tournament going, okay, this is what we need to do. This is how we can do it. Let's go and do it. And they've done it perfectly up against E-Home right now. E-Home, they need to find some form of answer. Be it through one team fight going their way and getting some form of map control back to actually not lose Roshan just like they did just then. So again, the second Roshan going down. It goes to the uh, Dyer. Second egg is, egg is the more now on Slada, who with that BKB as well as Reaver, he's going to complete up his heart in, well, only about 800 or so gold. Going to make him really, really hard to kill. They need to find an opening. Does it come through, Turtle? Does it come through, Gank? I think you, your question is perfect, Sind. Where exactly does their fighting potential actually come from? Where can they find an opening in this game? Yeah, that's, that's the question right now for Ehom, and I think the problem right now for them is that, all right, before they took that team fight, things didn't look too good for them, but after they did that, it looks terrible. They threw the barracks because of that. They definitely didn't have to take that chance. Uh, but obviously, they wanted to give it a go, did not work out for them, and now, what is the plan B? Do they even have a plan B? That's, that's really the problem. Uh, the Night Stalker is losing his strength in the game right now. The, the Dire Heroes are getting lots of hit points, BKBs, uh, Black King Bars, that is, um, which basically gives magic immunity when you pop it. Uh, lasts for 10 seconds, then the next time you use it, 9, 8, 7, 6, down to 5 as the minimum duration. And uh, then it's going to last five for the entirety of the game, unless you sell it and buy a new one. Uh, but nevertheless, that that's going to... What can Ehom do about it? When those Black King bars are up on, on the Dyer, the Shaker does nothing. Uh, the, the Night Stalker does nothing. That means all they've got left is, is the raw hitting power of their heroes, but the Marana and Draw Ranger cannot compete with the Dyer heroes at this point. Yeah, the Dyer's just got way too much money. They've got, they got so much support. They've got so much damage, they've got so much, they've got so much initiation, and then just the control during the team fights as well. Like, we didn't even really mention the fact of, like, Talix's, uh, Talix's shackle shots to actually hold heroes out of place for the Radiant. That just happens straight after as well. And now the SGC are doing the best thing they can do. Their game plan is sound. They're pushing the bottom. They've got a couple of heroes pushing the top. The, uh, the mid also has some support there. The Venomance of War is going to make it difficult for them to actually get through that. We do hit night time. So we've got to be really careful right now for SGC. That Night Stalker will be powerful through this entire fight. And he might even look to actually try and pick one off. But that might also be their bait as well. If Night Stalker comes out, if Night Stalker dies, trouble will ensue. In fact, it'll probably be a GG call if, if the Night Stalker or the Dro Ranger dies in the next fight. I, I, know, I know, man. E-Home e are going to play this oh, until Here we end. go. Oh, a bit of spike. Arrow will fly out. Bit of spike on the server for just a moment. I thought they would have actually, if that arrow, once again, if that arrow hits, they might actually have something. Nine Stalker thought he could actually initiate just then on the tide. But there was no opening, and Dro's forced down towards the bottom lane to actually defend this creep wave pushing in. SGC have more of an opening. They're now attacking on this tier 3 tower, but we've got four Venomancer boards up right now. That turtling ability that you're talking about, Sin, is just working out nicely for them. SGC do not feel confident enough to actually push in, especially during the night time. Yeah, they, they, SGC have got lots of options here. They can wait it out, wait until the night time is over, obviously. That could be an advantage. But at the same time, they've just got so much raw power, and maybe they need to lock down Ehome at this point before the Draw Ranger and Mirana get their second items up. Uh, because, well, SGC right now, they're sitting on the Aegis. They're sitting on uh, tons of hit points on the Slada. And, uh, well, that Black King Barnum is going to enable him just to s run straight through them with the, s with, the, with the sprint on and go in and pick a target and uh, the rest can follow through. So I, I think SGC are going to break this tower as soon as possible, uh, but yeah, Ehome doing whatever they can to delay it. Yeah, and, and the longer Ehome actually delay it, the better it gets for them. We actually see Dro Ranger now picking up a Helm of the Dominator with her BKB. 
So as far as like holding this bottom lane, it's going to be possible to actually do so pretty easily for her. But she's also getting farm while this is happening. Like we're noticing SGC, they've got four heroes who have not left the top lane in the past like one, two, maybe three minutes now. And Slada's there in the middle lane. They're losing a lot of farm during this point, but Ehome is actually gaining because they can farm from inside their own base. And this is what actually gives the turtle strat a... Uh, and, a, and a, a chance to actually work. So the farm difference is a lot higher for SGC right now, but they can't actually just not push. They need to get themselves in. Arrow will fly in. They're actually hitting on one of the creeps. They're missing there on the Tyrande once again, who still has, has his Ravage up. Weaver Wave will go through. Fortification now up on the tower. It's not dead just yet. They're still alive for the moment. The tower is actually now destroyed. Fissure there on Tullox. Nice Stalker still wants to get in close enough, but Amplified Damage is there. Then SGC, they claim themselves a Tier 3 tower, but they still don't have that barracks just yet. But there is an opening for Weaver to move nicely. Yeah, and once this tower is down, obviously going to be a lot easier for them to get the initiation. Uh, don't need to worry about that extra damage source. Don't need to worry, as you say, about Weaver getting detected. Here we uh, go, Venomous Gale central. actually hits on three, Fissure as well, SGC, the Ravage will pop! Venomanzer is gone, Nysorker is trying to fight it, the ES lets off his ultimate, Crash actually is already dead, Venomanzer bias back into the game, and we've actually lost one because he's already dead, but he'll come back to life again with the Agassi Immortal, Nysorker is still alive, Tullix on low life, so is Witch Doctor, but they're still fighting from range. Back up alive again, the Fissure goes, and Weaver time-lapses himself out. There goes the Lincoln Spear popping off even to actually uh, negate the abilities. Crane's taking a lot of damage right now. Ehome, they still haven't lost his barracks just yet. That's the most important thing for them. Weaver running in a little bit closer. Will it be close enough, though? Arrow will hit on Warlock. They want to kill off the Tidehunter. Fissure now goes. Tidehunter goes dead. He's the first one for SGC to actually take a fall. Weaver is still here. The Shackle holding Dro Ranger as well as the Weaver Wave being a pain in the absolute patella for these guys. But in the meantime, they're Bottom lane has been pushed through, the tier 4 tower is being attacked, but E-Home at least have some hope alive, even though they did have a very expensive fight, they did hold on to their barracks. I, I don't think E-Home could have hoped for a better fight than this. I think this was the best they could get, uh, given the circumstances, so that looks very good for them there. Uh, get the Aegis away from Slada, so that's going to buy them some time for the next, uh, well, until they're going to have to take a fight like that one again. Uh, because next time, obviously, in the fight, when Slada dies once, he's actually dead and doesn't res resurrect because of that Aegis. And, um, well, the trade they made, they already lost the tower when the fight engaged, so they rebought the, uh, the Venomancer. Uh, they lost the, the Night Stalker, but they killed Slada as well as the Tidehunter and successfully held onto their racks at a severe disadvantage. I, I don't think you could ask for more right now. Yeah, we will, well, more will be asked, man. More will be a lot more asked of these guys. Uh, E-Home to see if they can actually get themselves back into this game. We're seeing four heroes now pushing out in the bottom lane. It is, of course, the, uh, the lane they have the most amount of issues with. It's where the Rax is dead. So they have uh, larger Super Size Me Creeps wanting to push through. And in the meantime, Mirana looks like she's actually on the defense duties for the mid as well as for the top. But I think Ehome also realized at this point, too, they need to get these lanes pushed out because if Roshan happens again, when Roshan comes back up again, which isn't too far off, because it's only like, like three, maybe four minutes away, if the waves are pushed on their base, they're forced to actually be in the massive defensive mode, and they, go, they can't go out to actually challenge the Roshan. And I think that's when Ehome think, that's going to be the time to strike. When Roshan, when Roshan comes up, when SGC tries to initiate on that, we can try and lock them in, we can funnel them in with the ES Fissure, and then we can actually make it, make it our fight. Fight on their terms. That is definitely true. That's probably the best precision Ehome can get a fight in right now. That is inside the Rosh Pit. If they get a good Fissure off, actually blocking the path, they've got uh, the, uh, the, sorry, the Mirana as well as Draw Ranger. Who can SGC. Stand outside the Fissure. Looks like they want to go again. The Venomance Wards are up there on the, on the front line. Weaver lets off the Weaver wave already. Night Stalker tries to actually slow down the Weaver. BKB popping off on Draw Ranger. Fissure as well, trying to hold back Kranich from actually coming in here. But Warlock with that Shiva's Guard pops right off. Draw Ranger unable to do enough damage to Kranich right now. X actually dying. Kranich was tanking up. Weaver with a double kill. He was just sitting on the back while the Slada tanks it up. There goes the top barracks. Weaver will help out. Three down for Ehome. The last fight was great, but at this point, they just did not get that initiation off. SGC with the confidence walking through the front door. They'll now go back in towards the middle. They've already taken the top. They've taken the bottom. Nice talk. We'll try and slow them down, but this is basically GG for Ehome. And if they manage to get all the barracks and those mega creeps, there's no turning back. Then uh, Ehome cannot come back into this game. Uh, we've seen recoveries from mega creeps on a very very rare occasion but there's just no opening for ehome so if that does happen then stc will definitely be taking this game and uh, yeah that fight went well for them 
Reason being, Tidehunter runs straight into their faces and forces the Draw Ranger to use her BKB. And uh, then she silences off uh, Tidehunter, which is great, and then she starts attacking him. And then the Kraken Shield pops, he gets the Ravage off, and then it's basically the point when the fight ended. I think Ehom were kind of caught in a situation of all or nothing and just couldn't really get the fight there. Good positioning from SGC, forcing them to try to ignore the, the Tidehunter, but at the same time forcing them to hit him. And then, uh, well, what do you do? You do one of them and, uh, well, just didn't work out for you, home. I don't, I don't think they could have won that fight with the given positioning from SGC. And uh, you've got to say, man, well-deserved win from SGC. They definitely brought their A game to this one, and Ehom find themselves very much inferior in this game. 13 to 30 is the score. 40-minute win for SGC, and uh, we know how good Ehom are at playing defensively. They don't often lose games at 40 minutes. Uh, that's that, that's I'm, I'm massively surprised. I'm actually gobsmacked at this point that we even got ourselves to this position where Ehome actually lose. Just to give you a bit of an update too, SGC did play Moscow 5 before, and Moscow 5 actually beat SGC. So SGC are now sitting at 1-1 in this tournament so far. Uh, Ehome, that's their first game, so they're only 0-1. And uh, we'll be back here in just a moment with our next game. So stick around. We've got more action coming up in just a moment. Moscow 5 going up against Monkey Business. That will be your next game here for the ESWC coverage. Let's see how we're going to go. Catch you soon.